largely as a result of this of this this provocation. The one thing the United States doesn't seem to learn, our leaders after 50 years, is what we learned in Vietnam, which is the more we do this kind of thing, the more the counter reaction, and in the end we lose. And I, I just want to remind everyone listening to this that if you don't believe our um, our leaders are capable of making incredible, besides the moral issue, incredibly stupid miscalculations uh, in the interests of their short-term career. I have one word for you, Indochina. Uh, we wasted uh, $330 billion there. We had 50,000 men were there, and we lost. And um, uh, I, I don't have to go through all the other mistakes. The, the point is that the people running this country are not only immoral, but they're incompetent. Uh, it's not working anymore. And, and this thing of taking on the entire Muslim world, I think, uh, is, is, is a mistake, an incalculable mistake uh, that we'll be paying for for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, this you know, and really I really stupid. I, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, yeah. Well, I absolutely agree with you. It seems to me like empire in general is a policy of murder suicide. There's, you know, writ large, it's all it is. Um, but. You know, it's interesting to me that, you know, like, for example, John Bolton today is complaining that, you know, like Obama's the American Gorbachev just overseeing the dismantling of the empire and all this. But as you talk about in this article, no, he's actually lashing out just like the worst failing world empires ever do all over the place. He's expanding, as you say, into all the stans that used to belong to the USSR and deep into Africa. He's creating enemies everywhere he can. And I'm not so sure it's just stupidity. I mean, if you make bombs for a living, especially if you're an executive at a company that makes bombs for a living, eh, why not lobby to expand the war against those darn Somalis? You know, I heard they're really religious extremists over there or something. Yeah, well, there's something to that. I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of forces that that go into uh, that have created our present situation, uh, but uh, uh, it, it couldn't be more uh, perilous, in my point of view, from my perspective. Uh, that's uh, the main thing that 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 really got to me as I was doing all this research uh, was realizing the uh, you know they have a term blowback <laughs> and. Um, well, the idea is that when you do something terrible out there, it can come back to haunt you. And uh, I think, I mean, it, it, I can't even describe it. You see, the, the, the real problem from my perspective is we have a culture that values short-term rewards. Uh, take General Petraeus. Uh, I doubt he, they ever really sat down and had a serious discussion of does it really make sense to uh, destabilize a, 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 this poverty-stricken, feudalistic state of Pakistan with 180 million people, is that really in long-term America's interest? I mean, if they had, obviously the answer would be no. But that's not what was on Gerald Petraeus' mind when he was the head of AFPAC or McChrystal. They're thinking, how can I pursue, pr advance my career in the short run? Well, let's go attack those um, uh, sanctuaries uh, in Pakistan because uh, that will advance my own personal career goals of succeeding uh, in Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, in reducing, uh, you know, attacks from Pakistan or something. Well, you know, you can argue about whether that makes short-term sense. Uh, you, could, you can't argue about the morality, since it's obviously illegal to be um, uh, doing this in a foreign country. But anyway, you could argue about it in the short run. But think uh, over the long run, uh, it's going to turn out to be a disaster. I predict that Pakistan could turn out to be a much bigger uh, U.S. foreign policy disaster than Vietnam, uh, as I look out over the next 10 or 20 years. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I think the parallel between uh, not just Afghanistan and Vietnam, but certainly Pakistan and Cambodia as the, the country next door where they have the safe haven and we have to bomb them from the air all the time in order to fix that problem and then just set the place up for Pol Pot's come in and take over, something like that, a, a worse crisis, in other words, well, uh, that's, in that's Pakistan. It's so, it's so glaringly obvious. It has been for years. And you know what, though, too, I want to bring up one thing and get your comment on this. Um, Gareth Porter, I think, is unique in the sense, well, for a lot of reasons, but uh, in the sense that uh, he's, I don't know exactly, I don't want to characterize him too specifically, but he's some form of leftist progressive. Uh, and yet in his analysis, uh, all the corporate power in the world be damned. It 
it's just the thing that you identified is the center of gravity of the American empire, and that is the generals and their jobs as commander of this base in Kyrgyzstan and that base in Kazakhstan and this one in Somalia. And they once they have their job, they're a dirty snowball rolling downhill. That's why they coined this phrase, the long war. They want to, they want to consider all of Asia, at least Muslim Asia, engine country, just a place for them to just play their games indefinitely at the expense of the national interests and obviously the wealth and liberty of the American people. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, just because you mentioned Cambodia, I was there when the coup occurred uh, in 1970. Really? And and at the time, um, nobody even, uh, there was actually debate over whether there was a Khmer Rouge. No one took them seriously. There were a dozen guys running around out in the, in the forest. Uh, you go to the American embassy, they didn't even take them seriously. Uh, as a result of Kissinger bombing these uh, uh, the areas inhabited by two million people, um, he created the Khmer Rouge. He, Kissinger, is directly responsible for um, uh, the Khmer Rouge victory. And um, without, if we had not bombed enough in Cambodia, if we had not gone into Cambodia, if we had allowed Sihanouk to remain king and to keep Cambodia, quote, neutral, which did involve the, having North Vietnamese uh, in, their, in the far northeast region, just like now, having, having uh, uh, Taliban and al-Qaeda in the top northwest region of Pakistan, um, it would have served America's interest. This is a, an incredible strategic miscalculation by Kissinger on top, of course, being a war crime. Uh, the, the bombing he did of, of villages in Cambodia alone uh, would have led to his execution if, he, if, he, if the Nuremberg Principle had been applied to his behavior uh, and, the, and the Fourth Geneva Conventions for protecting civilian populations. But that aside, then they go and they support the Shah of Iran. Incredible tortures, you know, and this was all in our short-term interest. It was helping us get Iranian oil. We created an enemy now in Iran that will torment us for the rest of time and torment Israel and possibly, um, uh, you know, suck us into another, into a mini war. You know, they did that in Iran. I mean, I can go down the list of the incredible miscalculations of the people running this country. I think the problem we have now is Petraeus has Obama in a box. Petraeus can barely, I mean, Obama can barely govern right now. He's terrified that if uh, Petraeus, let's say, were to resign and, and say that Obama didn't know how to run the country, that his popularity ratings would drop to 30. You know, he, he, he wouldn't even have a chance of running for president in 2012 and so forth. So yeah, that's probably the to, only way you could get me to support Barack Obama. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and... Um, uh, so he's, he, he uh, you know, I wrote about this a year and a half ago. I, I'm proud of the fact I wrote the first article calling for them to replace Petraeus a year and a half ago. Um, he is turning out to be a disaster, uh, both as head of AFPAC and now uh, uh, in this Afghan policy and, and, and uh, promoting this assassination. Well, I beat um, you to it. I put fire Petraeus on a bumper sticker back when he still worked for George Bush. Okay, then you got uh, did you write an article? I hope I wrote the first article. Nah, I'm anyway, too lazy to write an article. I just made a bumper sticker, and then I complained about it on the radio. You know, I think there's a very interesting analogy with the whole Wall Street business. You know, now, you know, not to get into Wall Street for a moment, one sentence. Basically, you had a, a lot of very smart people pursuing their own selfish, short-term financial – they didn't want to destroy the American economy. They didn't want to lose $2 trillion worth of wealth or whatever it was. But all they were doing were trying to, uh, you know, make their bonuses, I mean, hit, hit their marks, as they said, this month, next month, next month. That's precisely what Petraeus is doing right now. He's trying, you know, he, his, his whole career is on the line. He could be president of the United States. As long as he doesn't mess up in Afghanistan, I'd call him the leading contender for president. Um, but... It, He's not thinking long term. He's not thinking strategically. This is, in my opinion, is the single most insane thing the United States has ever done is to take on the entire Muslim world in this way. We're provoking them. We're making it more likely that we're going to die, that Americans are going to die. It makes no sense at all. Well, and, you know, my friend Anthony Gregory pointed out to me that George Bush 
stutterer though he was, managed to explain a few times that we're not at war with Islam. Islam is all right. It's a religion of peace, and they believe in Jesus too, and everybody be cool. And, you know, that was probably the best thing he ever did, although he didn't even do that good of a job of it. And, of course, all of his actions argued otherwise. Uh, but at least he said that, and that kind of kept a lid on some of the sentiment on the right against Islam. But, of course, the neoconservatives have no qualms whatsoever about demonizing and demagoguing against Muslims. And to them, it's most important of all that Americans continue to hate and fear Muslims, as our previous guest was pointing out, uh, to continue our our policy that, you know, uh, of course, happens to coincide with what the neoconservatives and the Likud party uh, want for the future of Israel. Yeah, I was going to mention Israel, you know, Again, with Israel, you can argue, you can't argue the morality of what Israel does. It's, it's clearly one of the most immoral governments in the world in its treatment of the Palestinians and Gaza and all that. But you could argue, and they do argue in Israel, well, you know, there may, whatever the numbers are, there's six million of us, there are three million Palestinians. By uh, starving them, uh, you know, uh, impeding their movement, assassinating, torturing them, uh, impoverishing them, we're able to keep things under control, building that wall. You know, we actually, the killings have gone down. That's an argument that can be made. I, I find it abhorrent, but okay. But I don't see how anyone in their right mind can think that 300 million Americans can, can treat 1.6 million Muslims the way, we're, the way the Israelis are treating the Palestinians. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, of course, but that is clearly the direction we're going. And your whole problem now is if the Republicans take over control of the House and or Senate and the presidency, um, this anti-Muslim constituency will be the ones who've elected them. So while things are obviously not as bad now as they are with Israel and Palestine, that's clearly the direction we're going to go, and it's clearly insane, you yeah. know, just from a rational point of view. Yeah, I'll tell you, I mean... Uh... You're right. I mean, we're talking about sixth of the population of the world. Hey, no, it really is amazing that 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 uh, the war party can construct a narrative where, like, you know, somehow we've made it this far with the sixth of the population of the world being Muslims for the last what, like, 1,700 years or something. <laughs> but now we realize that, oh goodness, we, you know, these people might as well be Martians, not from here, who came and invaded and are threatening us all with Sharia and all this this madness, this nonsense. This, it's uh, it's like um, it reminds me of like a Lucky Charms commercial or something for how deep it is in terms of the propaganda. It's just the most shallow, ridiculous thing in the world that somehow North America is destined to have a war to the end with Islam in general. I mean, this this line of propaganda couldn't be more ridiculous or more effective. It seems like to me, or more frightening. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me add frightening because. Um... We're moving more and more in a policy of conducting mass murder in the Muslim world. They're going to respond, and uh, uh, it's, it's fomenting the whole Middle East situation. Uh, this is all occurring in an era where people who know about these things are extremely worried about nuclear proliferation, um, You know, particularly the, the new technologies with the suitcase bombs and all the rest of it. Uh, and uh, as I noted in my article, it's a whole new world now. We, we, we between the internet and globalized travel, and I boy, do we have um, several million Muslims in this country, and uh, Britain has a gigantic Pakistani Muslim population. You can't put up these walls, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the people running this country are thinking short term. They're thinking of their own interests. Um, they rely upon violence, and. Um, uh, we are in deep trouble, I think. And, and you know, the, the uh, don't get me started, but, but I actually spent most of the 90s working on economic policy. And I had a, an organization with uh, where my board of advisors included, Larry Summers, Paul Krugman, and so forth. And to make a long story short, uh, I'm convinced that we're, uh, America's finished as an economic power. Uh, it's going to be a slow fall, hopefully. There could be a long depression. Uh, and so what's really scaring me at this point is when I, I try to, I imagine, look at all this madness that's occurring right now, I mean, a Tea Party that actually thinks the government's the problem when they're the ones who are supporting uh, a police state <laughs> and uh, by supporting Republicans. When yeah, and they supporting are, the Pentagon. 
yeah, and the Pentagon, and they're, and they're supporting Wall Street, who are impoverishing them. I mean, you know, it's totally. I mean, I sympathize with their feelings about how everything's going, but I think they're totally around.